You are listening to the Experience 50 podcast for midlife. I'm your host, Mary Rogers. This is episode 233, Adult Beginners with best-selling author Tom Vanderbilt. Welcome to the Experience 50 Podcast. If this is the first time you're here, you're a beginner. You're a beginner listener. You can expect to hear stories of people getting kicked in the teeth, kicked in the pants, and learning how to live a post-50 life. And what a great day for starting new things. Happy New Year, my friend. 2021 is here and 2020 is in the can. I would say the garbage can for sure. Uh, Today, yes, today, today is a total treat for me. My guest is a writer, someone I have long admired, following his work for, gosh, more than a decade. I'm always intrigued by his subject matter, his curious nature, and his really well-researched topics. In just a bit, I will be welcoming best-selling author, the 52-year-old New Yorker, Tom Vanderbilt. Before introducing him, I would like to say a bit about the topic of his new book, which has already reached bestseller status before it's even been released. It's being published on January 5th, and the book is titled Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. So when I first heard that learning as an adult would be the topic of his next book, I was so excited for you and for me, because this is totally experience 50 fodder. We want experiences in our 50s, and we have some interesting experiences in our 50s, but all of us benefit from learning new things and learning how to do new things. So when I received the early preview copy of the book from the publisher and I nestled in for a good read, I I honestly approached it feeling a little bit smug because I pride myself on being a lifelong learner. I'm always digging into new topics and learning about this and that, watching documentaries or just going down the Google hole. You know, it's like, so what was the Spanish-American War all about? And I will go find out. And how does the Senate majority leader get selected? Well, let's find out. How can I rebuild my website from scratch? Well, let's find out. I'm always learning about stuff and I you know, almost to a fault, I have to admit. So when I started reading Tom's, it, it's it's not a how-to book. This is a memoir of his commitment that he made to himself to learn several new skills over a period of a single year. So in reading the book, I was, I was <laughs> surprised and a bit bummed out to realize that I was, in fact, the exact type of person who actually needed his book. And I had to face the fact that I have not been learning new skills. I have been learning about things, not how to physically do new things. Snap. So I have fallen into the trap of not taking on new activities. Activities. Maybe because I think I'll hurt myself, which I have certainly done in the past. Maybe I think I'll embarrass myself, or I just think I'm too old to start doing that. I don't know. What holds you back? So, this is the thrust of his book How and Why Adults Can Benefit from Learning New Skills. So, Tom's own list of new things include surfing, singing, playing tournament chess, drawing, and then a few other little things that he learned or tried, including juggling, snowboarding, ice skating, things like that. So we're going to talk about the skills he learned and then what he learned about adult 
learning. So here, here goes my, my introduction of Tom Vanderbilt. In addition to beginners, he is the author of Traffic, Why We Drive the Way We Do and What It Says About Us. And more recently, he wrote, You May Also Like, Taste in an Age of Endless Choice. Tom Vanderbilt writes on design, technology, science, and culture, among other subjects, for many publications, including Wired, the London Review of Books, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Travel and Leisure, Rolling Stone, the New York Times Magazine, and Popular Science. He has appeared on a wide variety of radio and television programs around the world, including NBC's Today Show, ABC News's Nightline, NPR's Morning Edition, Fresh Air with Terry Gross, the BBC World Service, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Fox Business, and CNN's Business Today, among many others. Now he is with me on Experience 50. Let's talk about adult learning. Here we go. So I can remember laying in bed. I I was actually supposed to be napping while my family was visiting a great uncle. And all I was really doing instead of sleeping, I was trying to learn how to snap my fingers. And I was four years old. And all of a sudden, I got it. I went from not being able to snap to knowing how to snap. And I ran out of the room into where all the grown-ups were yelling, I can snap, I can snap. And it was like I had won the Nobel Peace Prize because I finally learned how to snap. I was I was a beginner, but gosh darn it, I could snap. So here to talk to us about that magical feeling of beginning something new, Tom Vanderbilt with us from New York. His new book is just so fabulous. I loved every page of it. And I'm thrilled to have him here to talk with us today. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Mary. Great to be here. And um, just by the way, I'm actually a terrible snapper. Oh, um, really? You know, I mean, or just like mediocre, let's say. But uh, I don't know. I don't know where you go to become an expert snapper. But um, well, along the lines of snapping in my family, it was snapping. You bet you had to be either a really good snapper or a whistler. And I understand you are a good whistler. Whistling, I'm pretty good at. Yeah, I'll, I'll claim that. <laughs> but, um, but snapping is weird. And, and one of the things that I talk about in the book, just to jump right into it, yeah. is uh, joining a choir. And during some of the songs, uh, the, the conductor wanted to you know, get sort of a jazzy thing going on. So we would have to sometimes do something like stomp our feet in rhythm, snap on the alternating beat. And <laughs> having just sort of basically learned to sing a little bit, this throwing this other skill set in there was, was completely over my head. And I was I was you know, very awkwardly um, trying to <laughs> stomp my feet, clap my hands and sing. Um, White man stomper. <laughs> exactly. Basically. <laughs> well, let's talk about this. For the book, you decided to go on a quest to learn how to do new things. So give my listener an idea of what motivated this quest. Well, basically, I, you know, I was a parent and I think you know, being a parent makes you... Uh, a beginner in the sense that you, you have to become a teacher to help your child with all these things they want to learn. And often these aren't things that you actually know how to do yourself. So my daughter, uh, she was about four, I think, uh, saw a chess board in a library and wanted to play chess. And I said, yeah, that's, that would be really exciting, except I don't know how to play. So I quickly went online like people do, tried to you know watch these videos about how to play chess. And you know, I, I sort of got the basic rules, but I didn't feel like I was in a power position to really teach her the right way. So I did what a lot of contemporary parents do. I hired a coach, a um, great coach who's still working with my daughter and sometimes me today uh, named Simon. And it was, so I thought like right away, it was, it was fun for me to be doing this as the first sort of new skill I could remember having taken on in, I'm, I'm talking decades where I actually had a, a coach, which is you know, a very strange thing. But um, and then I thought it was this, wow, this is here's this weird natural experiment where you have a four year old. And at that point, I was in my late 40s person trying to do the same thing at the same time. And, and what does that entail? And, you know, everything we've heard is that, wow, the, the kid's going to kill it. You're going to struggle. Uh, but, you know, it was it was really great experience to to not only do it myself, but to do it with her and watch us sort of go through some of the same 
experiences, missteps our, ourselves. And uh, now, of course, she can pretty much beat me uh, on any given day. But um, but yeah, I'll take that as a victory as well. Yeah. So you were you were going to tournaments and you were an unrated player, as was she. And so were you you were actually competing against your daughter sometimes, correct? Yeah, in the beginning, I was mostly just taking her to tournaments and then doing what all these parents do is wait four or five hours in these, in these you know, very uncomfortable elementary school settings and, and just trying to, you know, mostly staring at my phone. I was sometimes playing online chess to try to get better. But then we started going to this great place in New York City called uh, the Marshall Club, which is this old, old school chess club. Um, and we played each other. Yeah, and it's a random draw, so you never know. And it would always be this moment where... I really didn't want to get her, especially because in the beginning I was doing a little bit better and I was sometimes beating her and I, I didn't want to have to face her in the final round. Maybe she was competing for the top three or something. And oh, what am I going to do? Beat my own daughter and keep her from the keep her from the prize. Yeah. Um, I went in expecting to be the only adult because it was this they called a beginners rated tournament. But yeah, I was pleased to find it was a very mixed group of you know people in their 70s people in their teens people from all walks of life all playing the same pursuit which you know, something you really don't see that often in, in life and really being uh, on the same level not evenly matched so it, yeah. it's, it's a very fun thing to do yeah well and being a writer being a curious person about human nature you kind of took a step away from yourself and you were observing yourself as a beginner as opposed to how your daughter approached being a beginner and started to notice some of the differences. Yeah, I mean, number one, kids, I mean, the, it's not a myth that kids are very fast learners. I mean, they're they're built for learning. They're they're number one, they have all day to do nothing but learn. Adults have jobs, responsibilities, uh, but there, there's other sort of cognitive things going on. They have many more synapses that are just being pruned, neural connections that are being forged. They're just gobbling it all up. I use the metaphor of adults have, you know, sort of more of a lumbering hard drive that's been collecting data for five decades. And if you go to search for some new piece of information, you've got to sift through everything else that you already know. Uh, So, you know, there's two different types of wisdom they talk about, uh, crystallized and um, fluid. uh, knowledge and um, fluid is, is sort of like the things you would use in a chess puzzle or or playing a or a game of rapid chess. Very fast analytical thinking, spotting opportunities, spotting differences. Crystallized knowledge is the stuff that you know, sort of wisdom and facts, the stuff we've all built up over time. Hopefully, we've built it up. But um, so I would have I would have certain advantages just in the crystallized sense. I had played games my entire life. I sort of knew how to compete. I had more patience. Um, on, on the fluid side, my daughter had this advantage of just being able to spot things that I wasn't able to spot on the chessboard and do it much more quickly. And this is what you see, you know, it happens every day now. I, I get a new iPhone or something, and before I can even take it out of the box, my daughter has grabbed it. She's whipping through the functions, setting it up for me. Um, it, it takes me a little bit longer. Uh, so, you know, because to her, it's like this is this. She's just interacting with that device on a whole different level than I am because I, I, I have a knowledge of rotary phones, for example, and right. like you know where she she's never seen a rotary or even a dial phone in her life. So yeah, I, well, and I really appreciated how in the book you share a lot of the research and information, you know, such as fluid versus crystallized uh, memory function and learning, and it was kind of like, for me as a fifty-seven year old. It was a bit of a roller coaster ride through the research because you you would start talking about a study and the results and the very dim uh, look of how things were going to go for my brain. <laughs> and then there would be a little, you know, spark of light. And, and I really appreciated the sparks of light very, very much. But on balance, what was sort of your takeaway of you know, for you over the next 20 or 30 years, the prospect of continuing to learn how to do new things based on brain science? I mean, number one, let's not sugarcoat it. The brain is, you know, sort of on a downward trajectory of, you know, you're, you're losing speed, you're losing memory, you're losing neurons. I mean, just during the course of this 
podcast, we're going to lose, you know, X number oh, of Tom. neurons, but, but it was, wor- it was well worth it. Um, but, but yeah, but, but there are all sorts of bright spots. And the, the sort of t- takeaway I tried to come away with myself was that you're, you're going to probably have to work harder than a uh, younger person, all things being considered uh, equally, but you know, you can learn at any age that this plasticity, this kind of sense, this term for how the brain can change itself, rewire its connections, that never really goes away. So, uh, you know, in some of these studies that have been done, people exhibited the same amount of plasticity in their 60s as a group of 20 year olds. It doesn't. And now that doesn't magically mean you're going to be learn something as quickly either. Uh, You're going to have to work harder, but it's there. The possibility is there. And what's great about the possibility and the working harder is that process of working harder essentially makes your brain, I don't know if like trick is the right word, but makes your brain think it's younger. Your brain sort of becomes a little bit younger. So this is, you know, I think most of us probably intuitively understand this, but it's just a good thing to keep bathing your brain in novelty and and new things, new challenges. Um, it, it can be information, but what I, and I should specify this book, you know, is really about skills. I mean, Information is also a great thing to learn. New information, exposing yourself to new viewpoints, new fields of study. Um, but that's you know sort of a different thing. I was interested in skills mostly because I had done a lot of the information stuff. And skills are this whole other level where your your body is really working in concert with your brain, and to my mind, raises all sorts of new complexities. So uh, just, but yeah, I met people. Uh, one of my favorite characters, a guy named Steve, he's in his 80s, uh, trying to learn to five ball juggle. Something I, I can't do myself. I've really, but I, I knocked myself out. I tried. I have not yet crossed the five ball, five ball threshold. It's really hard, but he's out there trying. And it, I have no doubt that it's just making his life, I mean, just better, not just cognitively, but in all sorts of ways, just yeah. giving yourself that challenge, making you, you can, I can still, he, he's, he learned three balls and four balls. So there's, he, he is climbing up this uh, progression, but. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I, I, for me, I, when I read, it's right in the beginning of the book and I just was underlining, underlining the the idea that just as you were saying, sure, it is, very good for your brain and important for us to learn about new things, to learn new information. It just makes us more interested in the world and more interesting conversationally. But for me, it was it was quite the two by four to the head because I don't do enough of this. I don't learn how, like with my hands, how to do something I don't know how to do, you know, be it drawing or a new sport and actually moving my body. And and I I think that is probably a lot of us are guilty of this after a certain age, like learning to play tennis or something like that. We just don't do it. Yeah, I mean, there's, and there's a lot of voices telling you not to do it. I mean, I talk about something in the book called stereotype threat, which is this psychological fact uh, phenomenon that's been observed where you know people have the stereotype in their head uh, for example i use the example of, of girls perform worse at chess than boys or girls are worse players than boys my daughter you know sort of had this so she would play a boy that was the same rating as her so on paper they should be 50 50 but she would more often lose to a boy than a girl at the same rate because that little voice so i think Adults, you know, older adults have this, that little voice saying it's not good for you. So it actually makes you perform worse as you're trying to do that thing because you think, oh, I shouldn't, I'm old. I can't learn this. Um, So we're already self-sabotaging ourselves from the get-go. Yeah. Well, and Um, you talk about falling down, literally falling down, trying some, I can't remember what activity it was, but I have fallen down as an adult (laughs) and it's not the same as falling down when you're seven. Yeah. Or seven months, you know, or, 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 you know, infants. I mean, I spent some time in the book studying these uh, or with people who study infants and how they learn to walk and infants, toddlers fall an astounding amount of time, something like 30 times an hour. And a lot of the, and they're engineered to do that though. There's, they're soft. They can sort of bounce around. They, they, they're, they're floppy. Um, yeah. Adults, uh, the activity you're referring to, I think was probably surfing. And I, very early on in my my would-be surfing career, I basically got tumbled over in midair and 
sort of pile driven into the bottom of the ocean floor and had some such a minor uh, spinal damage, which, which was very scary. And, uh, you know, as an adult, you're worried about missing work, health insurance, um, just, just, you know, your body is more liable to, uh, you know, injury. I mean, that said, there are things that are, you don't have that kind of risk that you can easily pick up um, swimming, uh, swimming being one of That's the most a nice obvious. That's a safe one. That's a it's really story. hard to hurt yourself swimming unless <laughs> you know, a shark attacks you or something. But, um, and I met some amazing older swimmers that were just crushing me in the water. And I hear, and I, I do do a lot of athle- athletic stuff and thought I, I would be beating them, but they actually were, were killing me. So, yeah, I mean, but you're, you're very right that, so the body is another hurdle. And just a final hurdle, I would say is, I mean, I mean there's many hurdles. Uh, for example, I just moved into, into a new house and we have this staircase and it's very creaky. And I want to fix it. So I start looking online, like everyone does nowadays at YouTube, thinking that I want to do it myself. But then, you know, this little voice starts saying, well, you don't want to screw it up. This is, you know, an expensive proposition. If I'm only going to have to call on a professional to fix it in the end. So I I think that's where where it's great with some of these things that you try to learn. You can sort of have this space for experimentation and play that is not, the stakes aren't that high in terms of like the damage you might do or the cost, right. um, you know, so I, I, I like to defer to expertise where, where I think it's warranted. Then I also like to take a stab at things when, when the cost or, you know, the, the repercussions aren't so bad. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed the part of the, the book where you talk about YouTube and how that is where we all go when we need information. And when you're looking at learning a new skill and l- let's focus now on your, your, your quest to become a decent singer. And you, you, in fact, you mentioned Roger Love, who's a vocal coach, who just came to my attention in the last six weeks or so. Very interesting guy. But uh, when we want to learn something, you, you advocate learning in groups and being sure that you have a live person to provide feedback. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. I mean, what, one of the issues with, I think online learning is great. And obviously over the last year, it's completely changed in importance and, and people are getting better at it. Also better at teaching that way and better at learning that way, which is a whole, we're, we've all been beginners during the pandemic, which is another point. But um, one of the things missing when you just watch, when you watch a video, when you take in, and there's a lot of great how to sing how to anything videos on YouTube. But one of the problems is you can sort of watch what that person is doing, try to do it yourself. You only have yourself basically to judge, have have I got it right? So, I mean, an easy way to fix that is online. You can also hire a coach, often at a much lower cost than going to see a live coach. And these singing coaches can be, we're talking like $100 an hour. It can be very expensive. And then singing, uh, learning in groups is, you know, just again, motivation is there. You're having to show up to something and there's a social aspect, which makes you sort of feel better. It gives you that sense of responsibility. I have to come to this class every week or I'll, I'm going to fall behind where the other people are. Um, but then I think just the notion of learning things with other beginners is a very powerful thing that we might not think about very often. Uh, you can, by seeing other people learning, you can sort of watch their progress and, and see what mistakes they're making versus just watching an expert do something. This has been shown to be not very conducive to learning because if you ask that expert, how are you doing that? They, they would no longer know. They, they don't remember the stage of being a beginner. So uh, uh, the, the, one of the best teachers is someone who's, you know, sort of only a little bit better than where you are and can sort of has enough self-knowledge to say, I've been there. And anyway, so just to see us, to, see, to, to watch other people make mistakes. And I think being in a, a mixed, a group of mixed abilities is mm-hmm. just a, a very powerful thing. Yeah. Well, and there's also a healthy sense of competition, I think, that, in that all too. of yes. us. <laughs> that when we learn in a group, we could be at a painting class, and you better believe we're looking over at our neighbor's easel to see what they're doing. Yeah. And then it's, and it's just fun. Also, you meet, you meet very interesting people that you probably wouldn't meet at your job or some other way. You're, you're also learning techniques from them. You're learning about the thing you're learning. You're, you're learning other things, just the, the aspects of being social and there's all sorts of research, just especially, I mean, singing is a very powerful thing to, to do 
in concert. And there's, it's no wonder that there are choirs all over the world. And it, it's such a, um, what's the word, established part of culture that mm-hmm. whether it's in church or, to, or, or secular singing, or, I mean, there's choirs for people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, just being together, working literally in harmony. You really need each other. No, no person can sort of rise above and be too good or too, or too weak on the other hand. So kind of everyone lifting each other. I mean, that, that to my mind is, is one of the most powerful yeah. co-learning experiences. Well, and when you were writing about your experience learning to sing, I was so glad that you spent some time kind of pointing out that singing, at, and, and I'm sure there, there may be other examples, but this idea that we have that you either can sing or you can't sing. And and when children are first being introduced to formal singing, say, you know, in kindergarten, first grade, singing with a group, and when they have to audition to be in the choir, I mean, here you have the kids who are most interested in singing, and the ones who haven't learned how yet are turned away. It was... I was so glad you wrote about that because I do think many of us believe, well, I need to at least first have a natural talent at some level for what, you know, painting or drawing or singing, but mostly singing. We just assume that you have it, that you've got that thing. Yeah. And one of the phrases you see most often is sort of, you know, God given gift. And I mean, and I'm not mentioning, I'm not getting into religion at all, but just the idea that it was it was with you from the start. And it, it might be true in a handful of cases. You know, there's something about a person's uh, physiognomy that that makes it, you know, it gave them a particularly interesting or nice sound. It, but it doesn't mean that it was always just there, lurking. That too had to be brought out and worked on and mm-hmm. conditioned. But um, you know, we don't we don't really hear a phrase like you know, a God given gift for welding or, uh, and, and I'm not making fun of welding. It's a very hard, you know, uh, motor skill to yeah. learn, but or building just, a website. You're not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, these are things that take time that, that anyone given enough time and instruction can learn to do. So I think singing that there is, you know, there are, there's this condition, amusia, which is tone deafness, which does present a challenge, but the number of people out there in the world you hear saying they're tone deaf is is here the number of you know here the number of people who are actually toned up is like that so you, people give that as their immediate excuse that I, I can't carry a tune I mean you also probably can't serve a tennis ball until you start practicing it exactly uh, you know? <laughs> well and I now that um, well I don't know that I should say now that but I can remember encouraging my daughter when I want to say she was maybe in fourth grade to start gymnastics. And she, without missing a beat, looked me in the eye and said, too late. I'm too late. I'm too late. These girls have been doing it since they were three years old. I am not going to embarrass myself at the age of nine to start as a beginner. <laughs> yeah, that's very dispiriting. And, and, you, and some of the studies you read, though, that you know, a lot of the, 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 the world-class talents really didn't get started until they were later. And there would have been nothing in that early development of theirs to indicate that they were going to be a star. Some, you know, sometimes there is, but, um, but yeah, the idea that we would, we would short circuit someone there. And, and of course, I think as parents, we take my daughter auditioned for this choir I mentioned in the book and, and she was accepted. And so I was immediately had this pride, like, Oh, she's a great singer, but I was falling back in that same trap. And what had happened was she had had some piano lessons and that had, I think had helped with her sense of being at, identified notes. And um, so she got in. So then, but then I'm no longer thought about, it, I'm like, wait, shouldn't every kid just be given a chance to, to sing and get better? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, but you know, and so singing just to, just to drive home this point, it's, it's a motor skill. It's something that you have to learn. You have to work on, you have to move these muscles and be taught the right way to do that. And there's a lot of great tools out there online I was using these things. Uh, there's an app called Pitch Perfect, for example, on your on your phone. It just gives you these exercises. You get a, a score from one to a hundred. When I started, I was hitting in the fifties and sixties. Um, now I can ninety nine or hundred. And it's not that I'm I'm some amazing singer. It's just that I've I've learned through through time. It took it took months. It took a lot of practice. But now I'm there. So it's it's not this 
mystery. Uh, yes, being a great artist, so there's there's some more mystery going on there, but just the, the 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 physical skill of singing, you know, everyone can get there. Yeah. Now, what do you think about, for instance, uh, former President Bush, uh, these older people, not in their fifties, but let's go forward to like eighties and nineties who suddenly begin to explore their creativity and gifts. Do you think there's some next level to this after just being an adult beginner? In terms of, of getting, getting better and making it sort of something beyond a more the motivation kind of for it, yeah. perhaps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, I mean, number one, you, you know, even people that are already in the creative field, uh, I use the example of Tony Bennett, you know, who was who picked up painting later on, and he was also one to pick up uh, piano playing. He's he's a you know consummate singer, but he still he still had he has still stuff to pick up. He's always you know he's been singing alongside of piano his whole life. Why at his age would he want to learn it? But to, to my mind, that's amazing, and just shows you know there's there's still dimensions to his self that have yet to be unpacked and and explored in this kind of growth the growth mindset to use that, that very familiar yeah. uh, phrase at this point. Um, he, he doesn't just have to sail off into the sunset as a singer. Um, and, you know, in terms of, I mean, one of the things that I think people often think about with something like, I'll just call it a hobby, but you know, a skill um, is that it has to be, you know, num number one it has to be something that you're going to be good at, that it's maybe that you want to turn into some sort of career or, or because you're, because you're bored with your job or, you know, you have some dissatisfaction in your life that um, prevents you from doing this. And the idea is that if, if you love your job, then that's enough and you don't need any of these other things. But speaking of older men who became painters, um, Winston Churchill has this great little book on painting. And he uses this idea that, you know, if, if you love your job, that's even a greater reason to pick up some sort of amateur pursuit, like, like painting or, or whatever, because it, you know, you sort of need to flush that, job that you're so passionate about uh, out of your head a little bit. Otherwise, you know, burnout is a very real thing or, and just to give yourself this perspective that you're not going to get because you're so immersed. So the, the idea that it, it needs to stem from some dissatisfaction in, in life or, or job, I think just want to dispense with that. So there, there's just many reasons for picking something up at any, any age. And, and sometimes we only think there must be a few or, yeah. or that we know what that's about. Right. Now, I think you talk about this in the book, but maybe I made it up. Take credit for it because it's probably yours. <laughs> okay. Comparing that feeling when you begin something, when you begin learning something or being introduced to something, how it equates to that feeling of first being in love. This is you. You wrote about this. Yeah, I mean, that, it was just you know, I don't really have you know research per se. It was just just sort of a feeling. But there are there are very precise neurochemical things that happen when we fall in love that we've. Uh, probably all felt. And, you know, there, there's a sense of uh, horizons expanding novelty and, and then just that sense of, of immersion. You, you want to know everything about that person. You want to spend all your time. So uh, when I first started picking up some of these things, it was that same thing where I just wanted to plunge in. Um, so, and, and each day was sort of a new horizon that I could, I could try to cross. Oh, I, I just learned to do that. Maybe I could do this. And I use this example of, um, the novelist Norman Rush in his book called uh, Mating, he he describes being in love as sort of being in a house with all these doors. And each day you're sort of opening a new door that you, you might not even know was there, but that leads to some other room, which is even better than the last one. And lo and behold, there's another door and sort of this process of opening doors. And I, I think that that's how skill learning is as well. That And then, you know, I started to learn drawing. Then, of course, well, boy, there's painting going on in that room over there. And hey, you know, well, painting, you know, once you start thinking about painting, sculpting is kind of an interesting thing where you're, you're three-dimensionally, you know, painting. Um, so yeah, so this, this series of doors. And then, I mean, the one study that I did see that kind of talked about your romantic relationship in terms of learning skills, which I thought was very interesting, was um, couples who pick up a new skill together can, you know, experience this greater relationship satisfaction. And, and the, the idea was, according to the study, that they can recapture some of that novelty they first felt when they fall in love. And, and the novelty of the skill sort of gets transferred back to the relationship. And they, you know, it's sort of a, a little bit of a second honeymoon and they, they have a new appreciation for each other. They, they feel that, that spark. 
that 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 may have been like slightly missing. I don't want to, you know, be a relationship agree- counselor here, but <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. But I'm thinking, what did my house? Oh well, we installed a garbage disposal together. <laughs> Watching YouTube, that was not very romantic at Wait, all. Maybe tango, l- learning the tango or salsa, <laughs> salsa dancing might be, um, you know, a little bit better. But um. well, and you also compare this to uh, because I mean you've written for so many publications and sometimes you've done um, travel pieces, and you kind of compare this to when you arrive in a new city, that your energy and your brain is just soaking up every detail of a new city at the beginning. Like right when you arrive, I found I thought that was interesting. It, why is it that we notice the details when it's all new? I mean, I would I would suspect the brain. You know, we must have evolved with some kind of some special preference, or or the brain must you know, be primed to respond to novelty, perhaps as as a hazard detection system. Like, whoa, new thing here! I, I really need to be on alert to make sure nothing's going to kill me. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify, but but it really is the experience that, and you've probably felt it yourself and your, your listeners, you go to a foreign country for the first time and the, the billboards are strange, the ads are strange, you know, the, the money is so weird and, and you're looking at all this stuff. And, um, and by, by day two or three, you're like, ah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's my, my Euro coin. I'm going to hand it to my friend Luigi down here. And you, you know all about the place. And it, it, um, yeah, you know, which is a great thing too, because you're you're becoming more familiar, and you're, that's even a little learning process right there, and you're kind of climbing up the level of of mastering a, a place. But you, but you do, I think, begin to lose that. You know, you, you start looking, or you're looking for other things, or maybe deeper. You're not paying attention to the surface. I, I always feel like I could write a travel piece in in one or two days, because after that, I'm I'm already jaded. Yeah, or, or sort of like a, a native. You know, I'm sort of like just hanging out. And I, I've I've lost that sense of what would other people find really interesting about this place. I'm absolutely right there with you. I I know that my last trip to London, it's like learning a new neighborhood, you know, wherever you're staying. It's like, it, it's just all so fascinating. And a few days later, you're like, oh, yeah, just running past things to get to the restaurant or back to your Airbnb. And you're not even noticing yeah. the details I- anymore. And London is a great example because, you know, as you walk there, you approach an intersection and it says, uh, you know, look right painted down on the on the sidewalk because you, you, coming from the U.S., you've spent your whole life looking for oncoming traffic from the left as you prepare to cross the street. And it that really takes a long time, I think, to because I feel like the longer you've been doing something, the more automatic it is, the more ingrained, the harder you're going to have to work to overturn that. So I, I've been almost killed, you know, so many times there by, <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it really hurts your brain sometimes to have to, to have to think that way. And you, that, that is learning going on right there. You can feel it. And it just also speaks to how something like walking, we no longer, we haven't thought about walking since we were three years old. It's just automatic. We could do, we, you know, so that's when you've really mastered something, you don't think about it yeah. until a moment comes when. Hey, Forget. I have to learn this new way to cross the street. <laughs> Absolutely. So th- this episode is releasing on New Year's Day. It's a great, you know, time of year to decide I'm going to start something new. I'm, you know, we're all beginners at what 2021 will require of us or have to mm-hmm. offer us. The book is available on January 5th. I believe right now, though, yes. you can do the pre-orders through Amazon or I'm sure any bookseller. I want to end with this. Tom, tell me, because your book is not a how-to book for the skills that you learned. It's more really kind of preparing and getting people excited about the prospect of being a beginner. So what is your advice to my listener? You jumped into four different skills that you wanted to learn do you suggest one at a time or have people come up with a list like you did and just jump in? How, how would you do this? I mean, I wouldn't put too many rules on it. I mean, I, cause I think I mean, number one, the, the great trap with picking just one thing, it might be something that you've thought your whole life is going to be amazing for you. And, and uh, Brad Stuhlberg calls this the passion paradox. So you think, okay, I bet, I bet I, I'm going to love painting. So I'm going to learn how to paint. Turns out painting is harder than you thought because you've 
assumed it was your passion, you thought it you would just it would just come to you naturally. Turns out it doesn't. Then you you might start to really resent painting. And uh, so number so in terms of putting rules or preconceptions, I would just plunge in and don't worry if it's it could be something minor, it could be something major, skill wise. It could be something you've never thought of before. Um, but I, I I went with variety because I have a bit of a short attention span, and I was worried that I would get bored. I wouldn't like something, and then oh my god, I've just dedicated an entire book to learning how to play the piano. It turns out I don't want to learn anything about the piano. Now what? So um, I mean, I think from a brain point of view, you could make the the argument that if if learning one new thing is great, then learning five new things five x better. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, there's that study hasn't been done per se, uh, except in my book by me, but, um, but I, yeah, just to keep your options open and, and just, I, I, yeah, just like the more variety, uh, the better. Yeah. I don't think we mentioned it, but what were the skills that you were tackling within the book? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it was, it was chess, singing, surfing, drawing. And, and then there were a few sort of uh, side things that also happened, in, including jewelry making. I, I needed to make a new, wedding ring because I lost two of them while surfing. Um, so talk about expensive hobbies. Um, and, and then I also did, and I think this is where I would you know urge people just through the course of the year, make a list of the things you have learned or the things you would like to learn. I mean, there were things that not necessarily I had done for the first time, but I, I tried to pick up again, ice skating. I did snowboarding with my daughter, you know, just, just don't, don't let anything stop you. And, and, even even these like micro skills, uh, you know, there's a great book called Micro Mastery. Um, I don't know, some cooking technique or mm-hmm. learning how to drive a manual transmission car. I mean, just those aren't going to take you years, but they're just, they put you on a better road to learning those bigger things, just you know, building a lot of these things. And um, yeah, I mean, the cliche is new year, new you. And I think learning really learning a new skill is just an automatic way to to build a new you. I mean suddenly you're a surfer, you're a singer, you're a painter. You might not be the world's best, but you can claim that mantle. Yeah. And being a juggler is so cool. I forgot about juggling. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I being able to demon- juggle <laughs> is it, I mean it's a crowd pleaser at any time. You were I mean you're I think it was your um you were able to do it in front of your daughter's friends. Oh, no, it was talent day at school. Yes. And the thing about juggling is that even the simplest juggling already puts you in a much different place than most people who can't do that. So it's, a, it's just a great immediate payoff that it just builds confidence and just gives your personality this, this, little, this little, you know, quirk. Oh, yeah. Well, my husband can juggle and then he can also make a, a series of very odd noises using his head and his fingers. And he can keep a crowd for about 20 minutes trying to teach them how to do these different tricks. <laughs> OK, is this, is this on, is this on YouTube? I, I think I need no. to see this. Uh, no. you know, oh, he's okay. a party pleaser. Let me tell you. So maybe we can set up a special one on one tutorial. He's got, uh, like. <laughs> Like he can do a coconut knock with his head and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, uh, but we're talking about you today, Tom. Tom Vanderbilt, thank you so much for being with us today. The name of the book is Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, available everywhere January 5th, or you can pre-order it right now. Thank you so much, Tom. This really flew by. I mean, I, that was super fun. So it was thank in, you. Yeah. well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mary. Oh, like I said, that was a total treat for me. I was delighted to get to meet Tom Vanderbilt and to talk to him about his experience. The book is great. If you look in your podcast player show notes, you'll see the link so that you can uh, jump over to Experience Fifty, learn more about Tom, get a copy of the book, and. Uh, Yeah, just want to say big thanks to him again for joining us on the podcast. If you're interested in, you know, this time of year and wanting to make commitments to learn new things, to pick up more daily habits, I am happy to help you out with that. If you are on my mailing list, you will be receiving a few little, you know, freebies from me on how to make commitments, how to stick to commitments and ideas for, 
you know, what kind of missions and mantras you could embrace for 2021. So be sure you get on the mailing list and you will also find a link for that in your show notes or over at experience50.com. So what might you learn this year? I'd love to hear about it. Drop me a line at mary at experience50.com. Thanks so much for listening. Here's to a fabulous new year. You've got this. Bye. If you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Experience 50 podcast for midlife, subscribe in the podcast player of your choice. You can connect with me on Twitter at E50podcast. On Facebook, I'm Experience 50 or my private Facebook group, Experience 50 Midlife Community. I'll send you surprises and delights when you sign up for my free midlife community at experience50.com forward slash email. The fun really happens on my listener supported Patreon page where I offer bonus content at experience50.com forward slash donate. Do you have a story of your Experience 50 moment when life as you knew it changed? Email me at mary at experience50.com. Thanks again for listening and spreading the word to your friends. You've got this.